Howdy, everyone, and welcome to Mumno Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And we have another fantastic episode for you guys today. Uh, this week, we had on Mark Krikorian, who's the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies. But before we get to everything he's about, wanted to talk about everything we're doing here at American Moment, um, you know, be sure to uh, reach out to us through the website contact form. If you are a intern or young staffer in D.C. and we don't already know you, uh, we're trying to help build community out here in D.C. Most of the thousands of you that listen to this are staffers. We know that for a fact uh, because we know uh, where you're listening from. And if you're in the DMV area and you're listening to a political podcast uh, from dorks like us, chances are you care about this stuff. So uh, make sure to reach out to us. You're not imposing. You're not being weird. This is This is how we're helping build uh, networks, reaching you if you may not have existing connections with other people you feel like share your beliefs who would recognize everything that Mark said today on uh, on the podcast is important. So make sure you do that. You can fill out the contact form or if for whatever reason you don't want to do that, just email me and Nick uh, individually. Sarab at AmericanMoment.org, Nick at AmericanMoment.org. And if you forget that, if you go to our bios on the website, I believe our emails are also in there, and you can just hit email. You you should contribute to Sarab's overfilled inbox. That's right. Uh, I may not actually (laughs) respond, but Nick definitely will. I always do. He's an inbox zero guy. I'm an inbox zero guy, and it gives me extreme anxiety when I like peek over at your screen and I can see you have like, you know, ten thousand unread emails. It's one hundred and sixty-five. Yeah. Oh, on, in the archive. Well, look, like you send me all these dumb calendar invites, and I just have to like archive. <laughs> archive. <them. laughs> you don't even hit accept. Yeah. Goodness. Oh. Do you uh, do you want to give the uh, update on fellowship? What we did last week. Who we're doing this week? We're, it's going awesome. The fellowship for American statecraft continues apace. We also just did a giant party, uh, uh, throwing a uh, goodbye party for Jeff Bezos uh, uh, at our uh, compound here as oh, well. Oh yeah, I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna give my disclaimer here to Jared. Jared, please put the uh, very cool image that we had at the party right here. Um, show it to everyone. Jake did a very good job designing yeah. it, and I think it's quite funny. Yeah, Godspeed, Mr. Bezos. Um, but yeah, we're gonna continue to do fun stuff like that. Uh, we actually just got confirmation that we're gonna be hosting. Uh, a really cool event with another fantastic organization. More info on that coming soon. Uh, But the point is, go to AmericanMoment.org, reach out, get on our lists. We're doing cool stuff. If you want to get involved in this in a serious way, that's what we're here for. Uh, But without further ado, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the guest we had on today, uh, Mark Krikorian, who is the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies, the premier immigration restriction think tank here in Washington, D.C., and also very candidly, one of the most maligned and slandered human beings that I've ever met. Um, he and is, one of the most like gracious, too. Like He is so mercilessly bullied online, and you couldn't meet just like a nicer guy. Yeah, he's just a kind extremely wise, extremely well-educated on his issue person. I mean, we've never had anything but pleasant, uh, you know, conversations with Mark, but for some reason there's like demented libertarians online who think that he's terrible. (laughs) Um, Mark is a is a nationally respected expert on immigration issues, and he served as the director, of, uh, the executive director for the Center for Immigration Studies since 1995. Uh, his knowledge and expertise in the immigration field is sought by Congress, the mainstream, and news media. He frequently testifies and has published articles in numerous outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and elsewhere. He's also a contributor at National Review Online and has appeared on all major cable and broadcast networks. You can find him on Twitter at Mark S. Krikorian, and you can find the Center for Immigration Studies at CIS.org. And they, in fact, actually just launched a podcast of their own. So if you you get the bug after listening to the podcast today and you really want to dig in and learn more, I personally have started listening to it, which I'm already pretty saturated in my podcast feed. But but this one's something special if you're a giant nerd about the immigration issue and want to learn more about it. So highly recommend that you check it out. Um, and then, you know, without further ado, we're going to go now to Mark Krikorian. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Mark. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. We always like to ask our guests how they got to the point where they are now. How did you end up running the Center for Immigration Studies? Walk us through the the windy journey that got you here. Yeah, I kind of dumbed. I forced gumped into it. Kind of, you know, I um, majored uh, in history and government in Georgetown, and then realized that's a completely useless degree. Uh, spent. I went to graduate school for two years. Got my master's in international relations, and 
still had a useless degree. So I then, in order to avoid work, uh, I studied in Soviet Armenia for two years. I'm Armenian. It was free. It'd be getting a job. So um, then when I came back, then I had to get a job and came down to Washington, was waiting tables, but was um, the, the immigration issue kind of broadly put the national question issue, I guess maybe is the way to put it, was what I was interested in. And uh, there was a group called U.S. English. They promote, um, you know, English as an official language against bilingual education. I'd heard of them. And so I was like, well, that's kind of, I'll look them up. And so this was a long time ago. So I actually had a physical white pages. I had to open the phone book and mm-hmm. find it, called them up, went over there and said, look, I have, you know, I can speak English, but I have no other usable skills. Um, <laughs> uh, you got anything? And they said, no. But there's this group upstairs we heard about. They, I think they're looking for like a newsletter writer or something. And that was uh, FAIR, which is an immigration group. Federation for American Immigration Reform. They're more of an advocacy type group, but that's how I got the immigration bug. I was only there for about a year or so. Um, And so that's how I got the bug. And a lot of people, you know, they come at it from different ways, but if they get bit, you can't get over it. So uh, I left there, worked in newspapers and other things for a while. And then because of a connection from there, um, they were looking for a new director, CIS. And I was, uh, so this was, you know, 1995. So I wrote up this whole memo about stuff we should do. And there's this thing called the internet. We yeah. send out email <laughs> lists to people. They were all just impressed. So um, anyway, that's how I got the job. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. So a large part of the reason why immigration has become such a hot button issue is because people take it really personally for a lot of people it's a very personal issue you know they have friends who are immigrants they have family who are immigrants maybe they're descended from immigrants themselves um what uh, you know on that note what people or experiences that you've had have uh, influenced the way that you view immigration the most yeah no that's a good question um i usually get the well you know your grandparents were immigrants how can you be skeptical yeah. of immigration it's <laughs> baloney but um my three of my grandparents were immigrants the other was one and a half generation she was born no no she was she was born here but she was born uh from a uh immigrant family like she was the american baby her sister and brother were born back in what the turks call sivas sebastia um in what is now called turkey um and um so i grew up uh i mean i have a relatively recent immigrant background but i also grew up in sort of immigrant circumstances in the sense that my parents spoke Armenian to us. I didn't speak English until I went to kindergarten. Mm-hmm. I mean, I watched cartoons and all that, so I understood it. My dad actually flunked kindergarten and had to repeat it because his English wasn't good enough. I didn't have that problem, but I did grow up speaking Armenian. Um, and my grandmother lived with us. And our even though we moved around a good deal, um, I still grew up in a small Armenian town because every place we went, the, the local Armenian parish was kind of our social anchor. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the point is, I grew up very uh, Armenian in a sense. But you know, I spoke English. What's other people's problem? You know what I mean? In other <laughs> words, um, there wasn't anything, and there wasn't anything really political to my Armenianness. It wasn't about, I don't know, pressuring Congress for this or that or any else. It was, it was more a kind of cultural is sort of a form of kind of cultural localism like if you were Amish or or um, you know Cajun or something like that um, and so I mean I had no problem really um, being both very Armenian but also very American if that makes any sense yeah yeah and I would say that that's that argument gets made all the time like oh we used to have um, immigrants and we're able to integrate them, you know, into America really easily. Uh, what would you say is has changed between maybe a couple generations ago where that used to happen a lot more and, and you know, is easier for people to get integrated uh, versus now where it, where it seems to be a major political issue? Yeah, I mean, I hear this a lot of times from people on our side of this issue. You know, my grandma from Minsk learned English and yeah. what's wrong with these people today? And my grandpa from you know, Palermo wanted to be an American and what's wrong with people today? Well, you know, what's different is, is the circumstances people are in rather than the immigrants themselves. I mean, people exaggerate how much 
their ancestors wanted to become Americans. I mean, in some mm. cases, yeah, sure. But people are people. You know what I mean? They keep kind of emotional and sentimental attachments to the old country. All that stuff's normal and healthy. But the conditions within which all of that happens changes. Specifically, technology has changed so that the world has shrunk. And that's good. Uh, you know, it's great to be able to pick up the phone and, you know, talk to your family members uh, overseas or wherever. But at the same time, that slows down the process of reorienting your emotional and psychological attachments from one country to another country, which mm -hmm. is what assimilation is about. It's not just do you speak English, have a job and drive on the right side of the road. That's mm -hmm. part of it. But that's not sufficient. You know, a tourist from Norway can speak English, could get a job if he were authorized to do that and drive mm -hmm. on the right side of the road. That doesn't make an American. The question is, do you have a an emotional and psychological attachment to the new country? And that's something that has to grow and develop over time. It can be nurtured through schooling and all the rest of it, but it takes time for that to happen. If you can hop on a plane and go to your cousin's wedding in Palermo for a four day weekend and come back, if you can call home in Pakistan every day on your, you know, in FaceTime with your relatives, those are good things in a sense, but they also slow down that process of immigration and frankly, really necessitate a, a, a relook, a reassessment of whether mass immigration is actually something we should be continuing under today's circumstances. I, I remember this. This is this is a particularly vivid concept for me because uh, my family, well, my, my dad moved to the United States in 1996. We moved in 1998 right after I was born. And I have very early memories of when calling home was something we did rarely because it was a long distance phone call. And I remember when we got the voiceover IP dongle thing that let them call home uh, cheaply. Uh, and that that very much reoriented kind of the, the normal pace of life in my family and my parents who are pretty much as assimilated as Indian immigrants can get uh, now uh, still call home every day. Um, uh, but if that had that process had been moved just a couple of years earlier or sorry, a couple of years later where that technology existed upon them arriving to the United States, I think they'd be much less assimilated than they are now. Um, and so this uh, the question of how. Uh, you you spoke to our fellows a couple of weeks ago. There's a particular phrase you said that that's really stuck with me. It's it's that we've changed. We, we being the, the destination country, right. uh, and that these factors have a real impact on the assimilatory pressure. Uh, because again, it's you know energy flows in the direction of least uh, resistance, and and assimilation is hard. You won't do it unless you have to. Right. Uh, and, and the point I try to emphasize, and this is important for folks who uh, are skeptical of immigration is that the immigrants aren't the problem. The immigrants are regular people like anybody else. They're not sort of, you know, uniquely resistant to assimilation compared to people of 100 years ago. And, you know, we kind of mistake the bleatings of their elites uh, that talk about how evil and horrible America is and all the rest of it with the views of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. An ordinary guy whose parents came from Mexico is not some kind of radical La Raza activist. I mean, that's just not their regular people like anybody else. The question is, what do we foster assimilation or don't we? And some of it, like I said, the technological uh, context within that within which that takes place has changed, but also the political context. In other words, we don't demand assimilation in a way that we used to. And again, it's not because somebody's bringing their kids to the LA Unified School District and say, here, teach my kid to hate his new country. They're just bringing their kid to school and it's the school's job to Americanize them and they're teaching them garbage instead of what, you know, my parents would have learned in school. Yeah, this has been where a lot of this has has broken down. You know, I, I moved to DC from uh, Minnesota and Minnesota is, uh, this. I, I actually think it's the the place where the most Somalians live outside of Somalia yeah, is yeah. in Minnesota. They get, that's and where then they, Columbus, Ohio was number two. Yeah, yeah, it's where it's where they all get resettled. Um, and, it, and there's been a program in recent years where, you know, there's a there's a part of Minneapolis. Anyone from Minnesota will know where I'm talking about. Uh, we call it Little Mogadishu. Uh, you know, it's where where a lot of the a lot of the violence happens. Um, most things, you know, signs, stores, all that is not in English. Um, and so uh, because of that, they've started putting these refugees uh, 
in rural communities, um, you know, towns with spread them out, basically. Yeah, yeah. Towns with under 200 people. And you're having a lot of the same problems. I mean, in the in the towns nearby St. Cloud, I mean, we had a mall stabbing there a couple of years ago that was that was done, you know, by by someone who there was just no path to integration. Um, so it's a it's a it's been a really difficult issue uh, all across the nation. I know. But, but let me interject. Numbers matter. If there's one family resettled in a smallish town and that family is, you know, like the local church sponsors them and the yeah. dad is given a job as a janitor in the church and the mom is helped by the women's uh, society, whatever it is, that's a lot more manageable rather than large numbers of people being settled somewhere. Numbers are of the essence, as Enoch Powell yeah. said. Um, you know, infamously, I guess, but I mean, it's just an obvious truth. Mm -hmm. Low levels of immigration mean all of the concerns, whether it's assimilation, jobs, whatever it is, are just smaller. They're less serious. And, you know, we're not doing that great a job at dealing with all of those issues. So it seems to me simple prudence argues for lower levels of immigration because higher levels mean they're, it's harder to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's it's because it's been a top down approach too. I mean, there's been no consultation or planning in advance with any of these communities. It's just one day they're just there, like the yeah. you know the bus drops them off or they land at the airport or whatever, and there there hasn't really been um, you know any any planning uh, you know with the local community or anything like that. I I want to ask you about you know a, a, a lot of times. Um, people who are for lower levels of immigration get slandered as being, you know, not humane or uh, not caring about people. Uh, you don't have to be euphemistic about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or racist, fascist, xenophobic, blah, blah, blah. I, anyway, yes. I see it on Twitter all the time. I think Welcome you, to my world. I, I think you are one of the probably most mistreated people in, in Washington. <laughs> I, uh, like, I'm going to give you that. I, I do not envy you, um, though, you know, I respect the work you're doing greatly. Um what is kind of a a humane approach to this stuff? I know I'm asking very general questions, but this issue is is so important, and I want to make sure that our audience, you know, gets a really kind of crisp view of this. What what's a humane view uh, of immigration into this country? You know, whether it be uh, in the middle of a refugee crisis or uh, just people who are looking for jobs. What's you know humanely? How do you approach that? There, I mean, this is mainly a question regarding immigration enforcement, obviously, although also I would argue that refugee policy figures in there too. But for immigration enforcement, obviously, people should be treated humanely. We're all children of the same God. Um, but that doesn't mean you have a right to move anywhere you want. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I, my sense is, look, you look at what's happening at the border. It's a complete disaster. Uh, and it's directly respond it's directly a result of the president's policies and the disaster isn't just that huge numbers of people are pouring into the u.s and will never be made to leave illegally um it's that there's all kinds of problems happening along the way you have unaccompanied minors um now some of that is you have to put in quotation marks because they're not really unaccompanied but sometimes they are people are taken advantage of all the time there's all kinds of sexual violence and explo exploitation that happens some of that's going to happen no matter what. The world is a broken place. But for immigration policy, we need to set clear standards. Yes, we're going to enforce the border. If you manage to get across, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to get a job easily. You're not going to be able to embed yourself here. So don't come. Mm. That's the most important message. And not like Kamala Harris saying, do not come, do not come, <laughs> and then winking and, and the policies send a different message, send a clear message, both in policy and in and rhetorically, mm -hmm. that don't come. And there will still be tragedies, there will still be bad stuff that happens, but it won't really, it won't be our responsibility because we will have done our part in making clear what the rules are, drawing clear lines, that's the issue. Because when you don't, when you have an open-ish border, which is what we have, you end up with all kinds of tragedy that we are morally partly responsible for. An open, completely open border, you can say, okay, well, anybody who wants to come can come. I, it's defensible, but I mean, that's Cato Institute can talk about that. I think that's terrible, but at least you can make a case for that. Or you can make a case for 
clear enforced rules. What we have now is open-ish borders. Mm -hmm. We have law enforcement and we might arrest you or we might not. And you're probably going to want to sneak in where you don't get seen because you're not sure whether it's really open or not. That's what leads to tragedies. And that, in my opinion, is what's inhumane. So we have a, I think, apocalyptic situation going on at the southern border right now. It is, I mean, there's been no better uh, ratification of a of what has otherwise been called a hard-headed approach to the border than what happened the second you pulled it away, than what's happened over the last six months. Um, a, just walk us through what's happened. What happened on the border over the last six months as the Biden administration took over? Let me give a little background first. I mean, we have the border crisis that we're seeing now is kind of a culmination of something that's been going on, really started in end of 2008 and then early 2009 when policies were changed specifically with regard to minors who were apprehended coming across the border. And that has spun out of control into the disaster we're facing now. And it's had spikes, ups and downs under Obama and then under Trump. But what President Trump managed to do is restore stability. There are plenty of things that didn't get done. It wasn't all perfect, but it was working. And what the main thing that President Trump managed to do was something called the Remain in Mexico program. So what this means is people were coming in either sending so-called unaccompanied minors. Again, it's so-called because they're all smuggled with smugglers, uh, but they're people underage who don't have their parents with them, or adults bringing kids with them. They were being released into the United States. And there's actually, the law kind of is, it's hard not to do that. What President Trump did was say, okay, look, we're going to stop this because we got an agreement from Mexico that we will send you back if you're applying for asylum. And asylum is kind of the wedge that people use to get in. You're not going to be let into the U.S. if you apply for asylum. You're going to be on the list. You're going to get a hearing, but you're going to wait on the other side of the border. And so people who were simply using an asylum claim as a gimmick to get into the U.S. were deterred from doing so. The numbers collapsed at the border. And that's where it was until January. And what Biden did was pull the plug on the so-called Remain in Mexico program, as well as a variety of other things, saying that he wasn't going to be deporting anybody at all for 100 days, and even after that wouldn't be deporting many people at all. And that sent a clear signal that you can come in. Uh, in fact, signal isn't even the word. The word that the smugglers themselves are using is la invitation, that the Biden administration sent an invitation to come up. Um, and I mean, I'm not guessing at that. We actually had an analyst who went and talked to smugglers in Mexico and casually they just referred to, yeah, by, you know, la invitacion is the reason we're doing this. And um, so what we're seeing is a rapid increase in the number of people being apprehended at the border. A large share of them are either families with kids or kids on their own, and they just turn themselves in to the border patrol. And what's happening now is the same analyst in Texas knows a lot of the state police people and the border patrol. And so we went down, was down with them for a night. And there were state police, the Department of Public Safety in Texas, border patrol and Texas National Guard on the river and raft after raft of people were just coming over. And our people were not, they had no authority to stop them or do anything. They just had to wave them up to the table where they went and gave their names. I mean, they were turned into Walmart greeters at the border. I mean, to the degree that the smugglers and the Border Patrol guys were kind of exchanging small talk. I mean, it's just, it is, I mean, apocalyptic isn't a word I've used, but I don't know, it might actually be an accurate description. Um, and so we've seen levels of apprehension that um, are, are 20 year highs. So this isn't some seasonal thing that's just, you know, like the president tried to claim a, a month or two back, you know, this happens every year. Well, yeah, immigration does go up in the spring. Illegal immigration does go up in the spring a little bit um, every year, but nothing like this, nothing. And so, you know, there's no, I'm not sure what the, you know, where this goes. It's not sustainable. And as, um, who was it? It was 
was it Herb Stein who said if something can't continue forever, it won't? So this can't continue forever, but it can continue for a while and it can get pretty bad. I was listening to a uh, podcast episode that you guys did on your new podcast about uh, available at temp- cis.org. That is right. We're definitely going to plug it in the intro. Not sure. No, it's great. I mean, I've learned a lot. I mean, I, I, I tend to be as humble as I can when it comes to what I don't know. And I learn more from consuming CIS's content about this issue than, than anywhere else. So highly recommend uh, everyone who cares about this issue, check it out. But um, there, there is so many parallel crises happening in our immigration regime. You have what's happening at the Southern border. Uh, and then you have sort of explicit legal authorizations that are going on, one of which is the recent uh, grant to provide temporary protective status uh, to, I believe it's a cadre of, of Haitian immigrants. Walk us through what's going on there. Uh, what's this policy and, and why was it a mistake? Temporary protected status is actually in the statute. It's not a made up thing. Um, it was enacted in 1990 to limit executive freelancing on immigration. And the point of it is to get, to give illegal immigrants who are here they don't have to be illegal but the point is they may be visitors but anybody who's here almost all of them are illegal when some terrible thing happens in their home country a natural disaster or civil war that leads us to not to to want to hold off deporting them the key issue in tps which for people who watched office space has nothing to do with the cover sheets or anything this is temporary (laughs) protected status the key thing is a work permit because, you know, ICE can just say, okay, we're going to hold off deporting anybody for two weeks because the airport, you know, is damaged by a hurricane or something. They can just do that on their own authority. The point of TPS is work permits because once you get work permits, it's sort of game over, really. Um, but the T in TPS is temporary. So it's only supposed to be good for either 12 or 18 months, depending on what they announce. The problem is in every instance of TPS, other than some very small ones, they are renewed indefinitely and never allowed to expire. So President Trump came in and said, look, the conditions for these or the circumstances that led to some of these initial grants of TPS, some cases 20 years ago, no longer exist. What's the oldest TPS status on the books? Uh, It's either El Salvador or Sudan. I think Sudan's have it for like 21 years and Salvador for 20 years, something like that. Hmm. And what is the the cause for them? uh, the I stated for, cause. <laughs> I forget what it was in Sudan. I mean, I think just being Sudan. Yeah. But Salvador it was um, the uh, hur- hur- hurricane or the earthquake? It, it was, was the hur- uh, earthquake. Hurricane Mitch, yeah. Yeah, Hurricane Mitch. And that was uh, Honduras as yeah. well. Got it because of that. Yeah. So, and the point is, this is for people who are already here when this happens. They basically win the lottery by not being at home when the disaster happens. So, they just get renewed over and over and over again with increasingly implausible rationales. <laughs> um, under Obama, they renewed Honduran TPS, and I actually went into the Federal Register report and, and read the whole thing just because I was like, come on. One of the reasons for it was they said, well, Honduras is experiencing an outbreak of coffee rust, which is like some kind of blight on the coffee plants. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, come, give me a break. <laughs> so President Trump came in and said, look, this is absurd. We need to allow some of these to expire. And in fact, they even were saying, look, we're going to renew them for six months, but tell people, you know, that's it. And so you need to sort of get stuff together and figure it out. Guess what? The left waged lawfare found some lawless rogue judges to put it all on ice, as it were. And so they weren't allowed to end. And they've all been renewed now under uh, Obama and I mean, under Biden. And what recently happened with Haiti is not only did they renew the TPS for the group, the cohort of illegals who were here when the earthquake happened. It was a terrible earthquake, but it was, what, 11 years ago now. They extended it to all the new illegal immigrants who had come (laughs) since the earthquake (laughs) over the past 10 years. And they all got work permits, too. So um, this really is an example. uh, There's a broader point here that executive, um, the executive has basically taken over immigration policy. And while Congress, I mean, while the number of people who get green cards is actually now is set in law, president can't change that, that's become less and less relevant. It's become detached from who gets to come into the United States. Because most people who get green cards in any one year, we call it legal immigration, they already live here. 
in one form or another. A lot of them are using the legal immigration system as a means of laundering their status. So I think a lot of we need to reassess how we decide who comes into the country to begin with, not just who graduates to green card status. And that's part of what TPS is about and there's various other executive um, measures like that where the president is on his own authority deciding who gets to come into the country rather than Congress doing that. Does any other country have an immigration regime as ridiculous as ours? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, every obviously there's eccentricities and everything in every country's system, but no, our immigration system has got to be the Mickey Mousiest of Mickey Mouse <laughs> immigration policies. So I think the questions, the question that's on a lot of people's mind is who's benefiting from this stuff? Who's paying for it? Who's advocating for it? Who's pushing for, I mean, as you've just said, the Mickey Mouse of Mickey Mouse of policies here in the United States? Name um, names. Feel free. Yeah, yeah. well, um, the all the money is made and therefore all the lobbying juice comes from uh, or is on the side of increased immigration and looser enforcement. The immigration lawyers benefit most directly. Um, the uh, you know big business interests, really it's basically big everything. Whatever, whatever noun you can put the adjective big in front of, they benefit from immigration. Big business, big labor, big government, big academia. They're all on the side of de facto unlimited immigration. Now, if you say, well, you're for unlimited, but no, no, we're not for unlimited immigration. It's like, okay, well, who do you want to keep out and what are you willing to do to stop it? Nothing. So they're all for unlimited immigration. And so it's, you know, it's uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is one of the major forces behind this. The tech industry uh, is, again, often they'll have particular sections of the immigration policy that's their kind of pet interest. The tech people want H-1B and all the things that relate to that to bring in cheap tech labor from, sorry, Bangalore um, and elsewhere. Most It's almost all Hindu men from South India. High caste, clear, I'm not high caste Hindu <laughs> men from South India, frankly, is, is like disproportionately what H-1Bs are about. And they're working at tech firms. Um, the Landscapers Association is very much interested in the H two B visa. You know, I don't. We're not going to alphabet soup here, but the point is, everybody's got their pet program. They're all together because basically they're saying, "Look, I'll let you have all of the tech workers you want if you let me have all of the, yeah. you know, the the landscapers I want." And there's obviously then ethnic pressure groups that pretend to speak for whether it's uh, Hispanic or Asian or groups, and they, you know, they say, well, this, is, you know, this increases the number of people they can pretend to speak for. But I think, I mean, that's, the money is real. It's all there. And in fact, there was an analysis of lobbying money spent on immigration by the Sunshine, I think it was Sunshine or Sunlight Foundation, and they found like 97.8% of the money spent on lobbying and immigration was all on the high immigration, loose enforcement side. But I think there's people do what they do also because they think it's the right thing to do. You always want to think of yourself as doing good as well as doing well. Mm -hmm. And the all of the major institutions of our society have become post-American, post-national. Um, I don't mean anti-American. I don't mean Jane Fonda or that sort of thing, although that exists too. But I'm saying normal people in the Chamber of Commerce and in universities and in media no longer really see their primary loyalty or responsibility to their fellow Americans. Um, and that, I think, is the kind of the, um, the underlying uh, ideological basis that even if people don't think about it that way, that's what drives this. And then they also are able to make money off of it. So who are the, the groups here in D.C.? I mean, I don't want to say, you know, the enemy, but like who... Who's kind of pushing the other side of this stuff? Um, like, actually, who are the people advocating for it? Yeah. Um, and, and the reason that I ask is you see a lot of the time these groups 
will like sponsor studies, right? Or they'll commission studies, and right. then they're it's like Coca Cola commissioning a study on whether sugar is good for you. It's like, right, 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 exactly. Yeah. And they'll and they'll well, the cigarette companies yeah. about how it's healthy to smoke. Yeah. yeah, and they'll just like they'll they'll just be like, oh, look at this. You know, there is one individual in particular that I'm thinking of. <laughs> uh, I'm sure we all know who I'm talking about, but he'll be like, oh, you know, as you can see, 97 percent of people, you know love immig- like unlimited yeah. immigration and it's just ridiculous yeah. so who should people be watching out for i just i first want to um have a caveat that you know a report research can still be true even if bad people pay for it so yeah. the question is what's being said what is the substance what are the assumptions what's the methodology the problem of course is it's very often dishonest or even right. if it's not dishonest they're hiding stuff that you then have to dig into it to find that it's a qualification. So I only want to say that because, you know, money itself doesn't make it false. I mean, mm-hmm. um, but that having been said, um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, is one of the drivers of this. Forward U.S., which is Zuckerberg's uh, immigration, open immigration lobby, is a major mm-hmm. player in this. Um, Americans for Prosperity, I don't want to sort of stomp on and cause any problems here but the coke people are you know basically open borders i mean ideologically open borders um the american immigration lawyers association is supposed to be an adjunct of the aba that helps with technical matters relating to immigration law it's turned into a lobby for de facto unlimited immigration um the cato institute uh provides even for the left provides a lot of the ideal sort of the the research basis i mean you have all of the people from left-wing organizations pointing the cato institute research which i found kind of (laughs) which actually i have sort of a theory on this i mean in it used to be that the issues that divided the two parties or the two sides right and left related to things like size of government and taxes. And so the Cato Institute and the libertarians in general, the Reason Foundation people and the rest of them, were ex- an eccentric part of the right. They were mm-hmm. eccentric because, you know, smoking dope and prostitution and all of the killing babies and all that stuff. But they were still part of the right because the issues that were salient were ones where they agreed with the right. They are increasingly becoming, the libertarians are increasingly becoming an eccentric part of the left mm-hmm. because they're still for low taxes and all that stuff, which the left doesn't agree with. But the salient issues of, of, of essentially abolishing borders, they agree with the left with. And so, um, so anyway, it doesn't surprise me as much that Cato, for instance, is now a functional part of the left mm. rather than the right as it used to be. And, and so anyway, though, all those groups that I mentioned weren't necessarily regular leftist groups, but the AFL-CIO has now become part of the high immigration uh, coalition, as well as, you know, what used to be called the National Council of La Raza, the name, the La Raza part became so toxic, eventually they made up a new name. Um, and, uh, you know, and then sort of regular leftist groups that just oppose America as such. Um, and so you put all those together, what's on the other side? Not very much. I mean, I don't want to say I'm David because there's a few other groups in that, but mm-hmm. I mean, there are probably... I don't know if there are 50 people in the United States whose job is full time job is, you know, immigration skepticism. There are thousands on the other side, thousands when you add up all of the immigration lawyers and the state and local refugee coordinators and the people in law schools who run immigration um, clinics, which are always basically open borders. It's thousands, thousands compared, you know, versus maybe 50. Mm. And yet, there hasn't been a real major amnesty in the last 20 or so years. Walk us through what the big fights have been. I mean, Gang of Eight failed. How did how did that happen? Uh, and, and how did the good guys end up not winning out, but at least staving off the darkness? The um, All immigration politics now is happens in the shadow of the 1986 immigration law. That was the first big, it was called the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Um, and it was the big amnesty that was to end, you know, the immigration problem. And we legalized almost 3 million people in exchange for, for the first time ever, prohibiting the employment of illegal aliens. Because before 1986, it was explicitly legal 
to the law specifically exempted employment from the prohibition on harboring illegal immigrants. So it was explicitly legal to hire and employ illegal aliens. So the deal was clean up the mess that we created in the past, give these people green cards, and going forward, we're going to enforce the law. And so there'll probably be, still be some illegal immigration, but it won't be a big problem. It was a lie. And I don't mean it failed. I mean, it was a lie from the beginning because the pro-amnesty people, Ted Kennedy and La Raza, knew from the start they were going to Welsh in the deal as soon as they got their uh, amnesty in place. Because in 1990, just four years later, really three and a half years later, once everybody who was going to get an amnesty at least had their work permit, they were in the pipeline, they tried to make it legal to employ illegal aliens again to Welsh in the deal, and it was only Coretta Scott King that stopped them. She took out an open letter in the Washington Post. Martin Luther bunch, King's Martin daughter, Luther King's widow. No, yeah. his widow, the Coretta Scott King, got a bunch of other black leaders, Walter Washington and others, to sign on to say, no, it's important for black workers that we keep illegal aliens from getting jobs. So on paper, it stayed there. But ultimately, Ted Kennedy and La Raza won because the enforcement just didn't happen. And that betrayal poisons the debate to this day. And there's been two major pushes to basically replay that. One was under George W. Bush in the mid-2000, the mid-aughts, whatever, 2005 to 7, and then the Gang of Eight fight in 2013 to 14 under Obama. They both failed, even though every institution of our society was behind those amnesty and increased immigration bills, because they would do both. Um, they failed because nobody believes the promises that after this amnesty, then we promise, we promise with their fingers crossed behind them that we're gonna enforce the law in the future. That's always been the failure. Nobody believes them. And it's even worse now because the big amnesty bill that the White House introduced uh, early in this year wouldn't even include a pretense of amnesty. I mean, a pretense of enforcement going forward. It was just straight amnesty, literally for anyone who had come as of January 1st of this year. It wasn't even like, well, you had to have been here for a few years and put down roots. No, literally they introduced the yeah. thing and you could have come less than a month before that bill was introduced and still qualify for the amnesty. And they may reintroduce it the next Congress, and so it'll be January 1st, 2022. They'll and keep moving it up. Yeah. And so, until, see, basically, I'm not even categorically opposed to an amnesty because, you know, when you've screwed something up, sometimes you do have to, it's a prudent thing to clean up the mess. Um, and the problem is nobody believes that we're not gonna end up with another amnesty five or 10 years from now. That's the key issue. And until the pro-amnesty people earn the right to ask for an amnesty by having real enforcement up and running, in place, functioning, the public just isn't going to buy it. We're not giving them the time of day. So these polls, like you were talking about, you know, 90% of Americans support blah, blah, blah. Yeah. If you tell people, okay, are you for letting a guy who's lived here for 10 years, you know, he's, he keeps his nose clean, he's got a job, he goes to church every Sunday and calls his mother every week. Do you want to give that guy a green card, even though he's an illegal alien? People say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. But you ask him, Okay, what if there's no promise to enforce the law tomorrow and pretty much a guarantee that you're going to end up with 10 more guys uh, who are illegally here? Are you then for it? They're going to like, oh, well, no, I don't think so. And so um, until that changes, we're not, we're not going to get out of this dead end that we're in. It's information asymmetry too, right? I think is it, is it you guys that do a, 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 an award every year or so for journalists who cover the immigration We used issue? to. We've actually had to stop it because... Yeah. Number there's one, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to do. Yeah. And also journalism has just become so yeah. partisan and stuff. Yeah. So. But it's it's the information asymmetry is so striking here, right? Because um, cases that tug at moral heartstrings for liberalized immigration are covered ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. And cases that are proof positive of immigration being done poorly get no coverage whatsoever, mm -hmm. especially in the mainstream. And so the deck is stacked against even the public opinion fight because all of the organs of mainstream information put it in people's heads that the average illegal alien is the 30-year-old churchgoer 
and not more realistically where it's 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 much dicier than that or at the very least there are pluralities and 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 significant factions of illegal aliens that that are a detriment to to our national order that's true but working in our favor and it's not necessarily good for the country but it um it 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 limits their ability to get that message out is that the media has poured gasoline all over its credibility and lit itself on fire (laughs) so nobody i mean those stories at this point are almost parodies in other words at this point a larger and larger share of the public reads the sob story du jour and just scoffs at it in a way that really wouldn't have been the case Mm even 10 years ago. And so, um, I mean, you're right. There's no question there's an information asymmetry. I mean, even there are now a number of angel family groups, which are basically the survivors of people who were killed by illegal aliens, either in a lot of drunk driving cases, some of them actual real, you know, actual murders. Um, And, you know, Trump highlighted them some, but they don't get any kind of you know, coverage or mileage or traction mm-hmm. in the media. Um, and, and so that's a very real asymmetry, but the very fact of the asymmetry is undermining the credibility of the media along with all kinds of other ridiculous things the media is doing. Yeah, I think people have started to, I mean, like you've said, they've, they've started to realize that they've been they've been fed a lot of crap. And I mean, that's why the the you know opinion polls have been so one-sided because people are receiving just outright false information i mean they're being lied to what are some of the some of the biggest misconceptions that you hear when talking to normal people um about immigration where they can say something and you can say nope that's not true well some of them are misconceptions our people have about Mm -hmm. um you know that that uh, you know crime among immigrants is terrible it's widespread. Well, you know, immigrants really aren't that likely to be. I mean, there's some research that suggests they're less likely to be engaged in crime. There's other research that suggests they're more likely somewhat, but they're not really that different. Mm-hmm. Uh, the children of immigrants, on the other hand, very, had much higher cr- crime rates. But my point is, um, likewise with, um, you know, you see with uh, misconceptions about illegal immigration. It's like, well, some guys relatively low-skilled guy from Guatemala doing lawn work. He might be illegal, but he might not. A lot of them aren't. And so there's even there's misconceptions our people have. And I try to, you know, sort of, I mean, part of our job is to, is to sort of educate our own people, as mm-hmm. it were. I mean, we don't have membership, but I mean, our own, you know, sort of those who are skeptical of immigration, to, to be able to talk about it and understand it in a... Um, uh, I don't know if nuanced, I hate the word, but in a in a more accurate way. And my, and my real fear is that the media and institutions in general, our elites' use of the sob stories and adoption of immigrants as somehow better than Americans is going to lead to um, regular folks saying, no, it's the opposite. We're better than them. And the fact is, you know, immigrants are regular people. They're not worse than you. They're not better than you. They're just regular folks. The problem is Congress and the administration and the courts and the lobbyists, not the immigrants themselves. I think that there's been a lot of ground shift in the immigration issue over the last couple of years, obviously tied to the uh, you know campaign and election of President Trump in 2015-16. How are folks like you who, again, pardon this phrasing, have been around for a while on the immigration issue <laughs> thinking about People like us, uh, you know, the, the 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 people on the block that are that are new uh, to the space um, and that seem to have a renewed energy. Are you skeptical? What are you concerned about? How are you thinking about it? Well, I mean, I'm encouraged to see it. And, uh, you know, um, President Trump has all kinds of downsides. I've never been shy about. I mean, this is one reason I never got a job in the administration, <laughs> because, I'm, you know, I haven't been shy about um, highlighting the president's shortcomings. But. He performed an extremely effective service in basically flushing out the poisons from the other side and exposing them to the public. And I think a lot of people among conservatives now, or there is a significant and self-confident element among conservatives now that really are skeptical of immigration in general. We've gone beyond the, I mean, the one thing I would warn against is this, you know, illegal good, legal bad 
dodge that you often see with sort of political hacks that yes, for the voters, they'll say, we want a taller wall. I want machine guns and I want alligators <laughs> in the moats and I want to, and I want a triple H one B visas, you know, that, that dodge, that scam, that's just increasingly untenable. And actually I find that in, encouraging. Um, and so, and there are new, I mean, not just you guys, obviously American moments, very important. And there's also other forces, you know, American compass and all kinds of groups that really, and individuals that really are finally not maybe coming to the conclusion or maybe are able to openly talk about how immigration as such is excessive and it's not just an issue of enforcing the border and i actually find that encouraging i think actually we're making progress the flip side of course is that the president president trump's tenure also seems to have accelerated the radicalization of the left on immigration and the left was moving even before Trump was becoming increasingly radical on immigration and essentially rejecting the um, legitimacy of America's borders as such, uh, which wasn't the way it was before. I mean, there are clips you can watch, see online, President Clinton giving a State of the Union address that, you know, Trump could have easily given, at least the immigration yeah. portions of Even it. Even in the 2008 of... Democratic primary, there was a heated argument over driver's licenses for mm -hmm. illegal aliens on Hillary stage. Clinton on radio I have it at the in the in the intro of my uh, our podcast where she said I am adamantly opposed to illegal immigrants well I'm not even adamantly opposed to illegal <laughs> immigrants they're people I'm adamantly opposed to illegal immigration yeah. Um, yeah but no it's completely shifted and this wasn't just Trump I mean I think Trump accelerated the reaction to Trump accelerated it so um, you know I, I mean in the one on the one hand I'm encouraged that there are more conservatives now and you know moderates even who see that the immigration issue is one issue it's not just legal versus illegal mm -hmm. but at the same time i'm discouraged by how it's become much more um not partisans or much more polarized because there are more i mean significant element even of the democratic electorate that has become radicalized on the immigration issue yeah and and, and trump certainly you know wasn't the first to kind of bring light to this issue i mean uh when he was a senator jeff sessions was a big proponent of of this for a very long time um there are also politicians who have who have lost their way a little bit i mean one of my favorite clips we have it on am cannon uh, both you and jake insisted on including it <laughs> is of um bernie sanders talking about what was it what was his exact phrase what did open he say? borders is a Koch brothers proposal a Koch brothers proposal or, well, I, or, or even another one it was well we have two uh there's another one uh, yeah i'm thinking um, of the older one like the, on cnn or whatever. yeah no it was uh it was bernie sanders on lou dobbs talking yeah. about uh why he doesn't what you know saying i think he specifically says uh you know america's a nation um and it's like wow it's kind of great <laughs> yep. so so who kind of a two-part question who else i mean aside from bernie sanders has has lost their way over the years like used to be good on this stuff and now you know has kind of been influenced by outside actors and why is that why do you think their uh, opinion has changed well um in bernie sanders case i don't know if his opinion has changed i mean i think he actually probably still believes that open borders are a bad idea but and this is the second part of your question is because the democratic um, apparatchiks, the apparatus, not so much the voters, although the voters too, but the democratic apparatus, all of the, you know, the think tank people, the campaign consultants, the energy of the party is all open borders. And so Sanders shifted because there's no way for him to be viable without it, especially because he was attracting the, more, the sort of anti-establishment folks mm -hmm. who were more likely on the left to be open borders. But I mean, you know, Bill Clinton, wasn't bad on immigration. He actually started the sustained investment in um, you know immigration enforcement infrastructure and detention and all of that stuff that that George W. Bush then, to his credit, continued and that Obama inherited and sort of you know pretended he basically he was you know he took office on third base immigration wise and yeah. said that he hit a triple and therefore you should give him an amnesty. Um, but I don't think. Clinton never believed it. I mean, I don't know what the hell Clinton believes, you know, in other Nothing. words, but, he's, <laughs> but he would have changed. But the point is, he would have changed his tune yeah. like, for the same reason Bernie Sanders did. It's that the energy is all on the side of anti-borders and unlimited immigration. 
Yeah, well, I think there's certainly something to that about it being uh, pushed by the establishment. Because, I mean, this is something that we saw. Um, you had, I think it was three in every 10 uh, Sanders supporters in the Democratic primary went on to vote for Trump in the general. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. In that, uh, the, the Vox interview with Ezra Klein, and I think it was 2015, where he says yeah. Open Borders is a uh, Koch, Koch Brothers, Brothers proposal. Yeah. And he was um, right about that. It's just that it's also all of his supporters. Of yeah. Course. Yeah. And I think, well, but I do I do think that there, there were some people who very much... Um, you know, bought into the fact that their jobs were being sent, you know, sure. overseas or yeah. they were being replaced here or, or, or what have you. Uh, some people that supported Bernie and then and then went on to support Trump. But, but I, I mean, that's more a dynamic of the 2016 election that people were just looking for shake to shake things up, you know, yeah. looking for somebody who wasn't the usual thing, who was saying something that the that the established powers that be weren't saying and both Sanders and Trump fit that bill and so there's going to be clearly a and even frank frankly even obama was elected he was elected for essentially the same reason trump was elected yeah because he was different he was you know some something isn't working and so let's go for something different and you know obama wasn't different he was just a regular faculty lounge left winger but you know his <laughs> his, his affect was different his background is different but also yeah. his message was you know there's no red states or blue states just the united states he i mean you know he gave a good speech if he yeah. stuck to giving speeches uh, you know i I'd, I'd be all for him too but well, he's making a lot of money doing that now yeah, well so. that's true but my point is there it, our political culture is unstable and so in that kind of instability, you get people who are different that people attracted to, whether it's Obama, whether it's Sanders or whether it's Trump. And the question yeah. is, who's the next guy like that going to be? So do you Tucker, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Um, God willing. Do you, <laughs> do you view uh, the immigration issue, you know, legal and illegal or, or, or both um, as more of an economic issue or a cultural issue? Yes, <laughs> okay. um, the uh, in my 2008 book, which is now in the digital remainder bin, the argument I tried to make, I tried to present a unified field theory of immigration and that the image is basically like the story about the blind men all holding different parts of the same elephant. Mm. One guy held the tail and thought it was a broom and the other guy bumped into the foot and thought it was a tree. It's all the same elephant. So that all of the aspects of immigration, whether it's cultural, whether it's economics, whether it's government services, whether it's security or assimilation, they're all the same thing. They're different facets of the incompatibility of mass immigration with the goals and characteristics of a modern society. Um, the image that I had in my introduction that my editor made me take out, <laughs> so Bernadette, I'm putting it back in, I mention it all the time, <laughs> is to donuts. When you're seven years old, donuts are good for you. You need the fat, you need the calories, it helps you. When you're 47 years old, you can't eat donuts the same way. It's the same donuts, there's nothing wrong with them. They haven't gotten worse, they're not poisonous, they're not inferior, it's exactly the same thing. Your metabolism has changed. And our national, everybody's national metabolism, I think modernity is something, is a phase that we as human societies pass through are passing through that makes mass immigration much more problematic than it ever was in all of those respects, whether it's economics or assimilation or whatever it is. Mm. Immigration is an issue that inspires a lot of passion. And I have friends and I've seen figures who uh, get themselves really worked up about immigration. And then um, in a five year time horizon, the action that they see is imminently required in order to to save America doesn't happen in order to fix the immigration regime. And so they get, as as we kids say, blackpilled or they become pessimistic or apocalyptic. Oh, yeah. I've never. Um, what is blackpilled? Is that what that means? Okay, well, it's, I've it, never. It's it's an extension. I'm not of the, up with the, it, you know, the with the that's hip, fine. This hep, is why we exist. lingo of the young people. <laughs> yeah, we, this is this is why we sent to Zoomer to CIS to teach uh, teach you guys about the lingo. But it's, you know, it's an extension of the Matrix reference, red pill versus sure, blue sure, pill. Yeah. The black pill is pessimism. OK. Um, uh, uh, and despair is a sin. This would be my it answer. Is. And, <laughs> but, but I guess, you know, why shouldn't we be despaired? Because, because the, the immigration status quo is something that is bad. And we've had 40 years of bad. And stopping amnesties 
makes it doesn't it's it's, it's a no new it stab slows wound. down the getting worse but yeah. it's still bad yes yeah. so why are you optimistic or, or are you not what what is what why, why shouldn't people take the black pill yeah i'm optimistic partly because i don't know it's a personality thing to some yeah. degree you um, wouldn't be in the position you are yeah. if you why weren't. would i be doing this for 25 yeah. years if i was um it's not like i'm getting rich <laughs> um but it's never too late because you know to some degree our country really is every country is a river that you know you never step in twice the same river um we you know our country has changed over time um and i think we can accommodate further i mean we can deal with the damage that immigrate that excessive immigration has done to our country um and what encourages me is that the immigrants aren't anti-american they're not here to screw us up some of them are but for the most part they're not and you know i was actually quite encouraged when we saw that you know trump actually got a significant share of a bigger share of the hispanic vote uh and the black vote which is americans it's not an immigrant thing but i think most americans there is still a sense of um common peoplehood and as much as blm and antifa try to undo that and they you know they have had some success i'm not saying everything's you know a bowl of cherries ultimately i'm confident this can work if we can dial back on immigration also if we can sort of dial back on some of the racialism you know it's going to work out people i mean intermarriage rates are very high um and it's sort of the way maybe the other way to put it is to sort of from a optimistic pessimist is to say look okay maybe we are screwed but everybody else in the world is more screwed than we are um i mean just look at you know our immigration problem versus europe's immigration problem um you know i don't think individual muslims in any way are sort of ipso facto incapable of being integrated but they've admitted huge numbers of people that from societies that they have been at odds with historically for millennia that's you know that's going to be hard for them to deal with most of our immigrants are from latin america or from asia and there aren't the same sort of there isn't the same degree of cultural baggage or historical baggage there isn't the same sort of cultural obstacles to americanization we've you know we have huge numbers of patriotic americans whose you know roots were in latin america i mean just look at all those people in the rio grande valley of texas voting for trump it's because they're just regular americans they drive pickup trucks they got gun racks they just they're you know they serve in the army it's just they happen to their great their great grandparents came from mexico um that gives me hope so it's never too late um and um we are i i think we're making progress we're not making progress in congress yet but we are making progress because we have to we have to develop a not just an intellectual basis but a sort of the the political preconditions for changing policy and i think we're starting to see that and hopefully uh fingers crossed uh president desantis will start that process in 2025 so you're a writer um and there are a lot of great resources out there uh you know about the um immigration restriction you know movement i, I know one of my favorite books it actually wasn't technically i would say a restrictionist book but i read um douglas murray's uh, the strange death of europe mm -hmm. um which is on am canon uh you know something that we definitely encourage people to read um what would you encourage our listeners to to listen to to gain a better view of um you know immigration in the united states and our kind of worldview the uh one book i'd recommend it's not very long it's not real wonky is george borjas's we wanted workers it's called we wanted workers he's a harvard economist uh born in cuba and it's not the book is not like a textbook on economics or anything i mean it's got a little bit of economics but it's intuitive stuff and it it doesn't even tell you what to think about immigration it sort of helps you think how you, it helps show you how to think about the economics of immigration basically there's winners there's losers and as he himself puts it who were you rooting for 
In other words, sort of which of if if some some people win and lose from it, as in any government policy, how do you what do you think of the people who are winning and losing, and which ones do you think government policies should favor? So anyway, we wanted workers by George Borjas. It's not a very long book. I recommend that. And then, I mean, I have to recommend my own book, don't I? I was uh, hoping you would. Yeah, the new case against immigration, both legal and illegal. Um, you have to go on Amazon, and people are either it's used or it's there. The publisher, they even got rid of the um, Kindle version, even though it costs nothing to keep. So I got to say, I'm a little ticked off at Penguin, but um, the point is that's there. That's you know a little longer than Borjas's book, but again, it's not a textbook. It's uh, I think it's a relatively easy read, and it hel- again it helps you think th- helps you think through the issue. I have a v- I have a point of view. But and you may not have the same point of view, but I think it helps even people who might disagree with me understand, you know, how to think about what the issues are. And then, of course, there's lots of materials uh, that the Center for Immigration Studies puts out. Uh, where can people cis dot org okay. cis dot org? And I'm on Twitter. If you like snark and sarcasm, at Mark S as in Stephen Mark S Krikorian. And I tweet on immigration as well as other things. That's and we have a podcast, which I mentioned Absolutely, before, that everyone should listen calling to. Calling it Parsing Immigration Policy is what we call it. That's great. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Mark, and for everything that you do. Thanks for having me. Great conversation. We decided to talk a little bit of shop today, and so we're going to recommend that you guys take a look at uh, one of our board members, Ryan Gerdusky's book, They're Not Listening, How the Elites Created the Nationalist Populist Revolution. Look, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in America, uh, or well, that is America, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Africa, Asia, you'll find that a lot of the causes for uh, these political revolutions uh, across the country and across the world where right-wing leaders uh, who have the support of the masses rise to power has to do a lot with immigration. And so it it dovetails really well with everything we talked about with Mark today in terms of, uh, you know, why this issue is important and why it touches on all sorts of aspects of what it means to be a nation. And so, uh, you know, make him a little bit pink between the ears and, and go buy his book, give it a read. Uh, it's a primer uh, like no other on, on everything we care about here at American Moment, from economics to immigration to foreign policy to families and more. I, I think it's just a fantastic book. I mean, I think the the thing that strikes me the most about Ryan's book, you know, for for being such a an uncultured rube, uh, <laughs> he he has hundreds of citations and and I think there's over 600 citations in that book. Yeah, and 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 you can see it right there, you know, if you're if you're watching online, like it's not a huge book, but it is it is extremely well cited. And I know as soon as this goes live, I'm going to get a very angry text from Ryan, possibly disinviting himself from my uh from my wedding for making fun of him. But Really, it is it is one of the most fantastic books uh, I've read on policy and on why elites in Washington and in capitals uh, across the West are failing us. So I highly recommend that you check it out. Make Ryan a little pink between the ears and put a little money in his pocket. Yeah, it. Uh, we were joking right before the podcast started. Nick, the second we got done taping, said, so what did you say exactly? I'm trying to think through which demeaning thing you're referring to. <laughs> Regarding but my ability to read. Or oh, not. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, said, I said that I'm not convinced that you actually know anything, that you just regurgitate things that you heard on podcasts or saw on Twitter. That's right. But I did read Ryan's book, and it was fantastic. So, <laughs> so you're that, Ryan, you're it. special in more ways than one. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, no, it's it's a really good book. We highly recommend you take a look at it. And and look, I mean, the, the, my, I'll make a case for myself as a podcast listener. Uh, look, we're not writing books here at American Moment. We're doing this podcast for a reason. This is a way that people consume information in an important way. Actually, I'm going to make another plug as well. Um, one of our dear friends, Sagar and Jetty, uh, has uh, gone independent from the Hill TV. I mean, look, they have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So chances are that if you're a fan, you've figured that out already. But I'm going to encourage you guys to go subscribe to Breaking Points, his new show as well, because uh, and they've 
catapulted to the number one podcast in the United States. They've surpassed Joe Rogan. They've surpassed, uh, you know, the, the the Daily from the New York Times. They're absolutely crushing it. So, you know, send some love their way. Go make sure you watch. Um, they're they're completely unshackled from corporate media now and are doing really cool stuff there as well. Yeah, <laughs> you said it. <laughs> Once again, always make sure to rate us five stars and subscribe to the podcast. Send it to a friend. Um, listen to the backlog. I still get random messages where people are like, I listened to the David Azarad episode. And it was amazing. And I'm like, that's cool. You're really <laughs> far behind the times. But yeah. Great. No, I mean, it, it, we're, we're starting to really develop, I think, a fairly impressive backlog of guests uh, ranging from different domains of American life. We've had on elected officials now, think tank leaders, media figures, uh, and so on. And, and we're going to continue to have incredible guests uh, throughout the rest of this year. And, and we told ourselves we're going to do this podcast for a year. We're going to do it every week, maybe even some extra episodes. And then we'll evaluate if we want to keep doing it. So help us make sure that we continue to do it by making sure all of your friends are listening to it. Yeah. And on the t- topic of you know we might do it more than once a week uh i don't know if you've had the chance to listen to our bonus episode that we did with uh with jake and emma uh who are also here at american moment we did a bit of a round table let us know if you want us to do that again we're more than willing to we'll get a drink in all of us and and share more of our true uh opinions uh, feel free to shoot us an email or better yet leave us a five-star review with a question you'd like us to answer on the show and let us know if you'd like us to do more of those episodes. Absolutely. Uh, and without further ado, we'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.